So today's topic is Mari Shemun, the 23rd Patriarch of the Church of the East or the Assyrian Church of the East, uh, as it came to be known later after 1976. And this topic still arouses among many people uh, strong feelings. And I want to just say something before we begin, before we delve into the topic, and tell you that, um, you know, it's never easy and, and we never really seek to pass judgment on the rights and wrongs of the past uh, more than study them. So our desire is really to study them and, and allow you to come to conclusions. So I do want to promise you that, um, that I'm going to strive to, of course, reserve judgment, uh, not so much reserve my reflections on, on this, the various episodes and the personalities and the events that we are about to talk about together. But I, I, I'm going to try, I don't know if I'm going to succeed in staying away from my own feelings about the subject, and I'm going to tell you why. I will go back to an evening in Baghdad, Iraq, somewhere around 1972 or 1973, when I was a little boy running around in the yard. It was in the evening when my parents and extended family would get together outside during the summer and spring and sit and gather with neighbors, with relatives, and, and so on, and talk usually in a very friendly way. On this particular evening, there was a lot of yelling, and there were about maybe 20 or 30 people, largely belonging to our family, yelling at each other, various people, as I recall. And the topic of discussion or argument was Mar'i Sheshemun, the patriarch, who at that time was in the United States. And Mari Shimon at the time had resigned from his position as patriarch. And so there was a pro-patriarch and an anti-patriarch position being espoused on that particular night. And I heard this yelling and, and I wasn't able to make out exactly what was going on. And I, I recall my mother taking my hand and taking me inside as if a, away from the commotion outside between the various family members. And I've always asked myself, who was this person, this patriarch, this leader of the Assyrian people that, that meant so much to us how do we reflect on who he was? So I, it, it has always remained with me that he was someone extremely important. I do recall a few years prior to this night, this evening in Baghdad, walking the streets with thousands and thousands of Assyrians as we welcomed the patriarch back to his homeland. Remember, he had been exiled as a young patriarch and leader of his people from Iraq in 1933, in the year that Semele took place, the massacres of the Assyrians. Thousands of Assyrians were killed as he was exiled to Cyprus, and he remained in Cyprus from 1933 to about 1940, when the entire family of the patriarch was uh, exiled uh, from their homeland. And I always remember family members being at times supportive, at times questioning, at times critical of this man, but he was always at the center of attention and always an important figure as if a father in a family, for example, 
held with a great deal of respect and reverence. And I am going to talk about the Marshamun family, its historical roots in the Church of the East and in the Assyrian nation going back hundreds of years and how important this figure was. He wasn't simply elected to this position uh, from nowhere. He came from a very important historical family that had been rooted in the Church of the East for centuries. And he held a position like his ancestors hundreds of years prior that was extremely important, especially in history, but extremely important for Assyrians symbolically and uh, as a matter of their faith and culture. So with that, let's begin to explore who was Marishe Shimon and what did he stand for? I want to take you to a difficult day and night for this family, and that was November 5th, 1975, when this couple, a man and his wife, had just finished eating dinner, and as was their practice, had he had been preparing for coffee in the evening. And what happened next would shock many Assyrians. Perhaps it came as no surprise to some, but it certainly shocked the majority of the Assyrian people. And it would be a topic for discussion for decades. We're nearing 50 years from that evening, that fatal evening, and still there is a discussion among many people about this topic, about that evening, about the persons involved whose lives came together in San Jose, California on November 5th, 1975. Now from the trial transcripts, we are told that the silence was shattered when she being the wife of Marishe Shimon, Imama, heard the patriarch screamed her name twice. He had told her that he would call her name twice if anything happened. And there was, according to many people, discussions that he had believed that he was going to be targeted at some point. He was going to be killed, um, perhaps not by his own people, but he definitely had on his mind that he may be targeted. Well, upon hearing his, her name twice, she was to lock herself in a room and with the baby and then call for help, but that's not what she did. Instead, she ran downstairs and she rushed to see what was going on with her husband. And that's when she found him struck with three bullets in his chest and he was dying. Now, in, a, in an interview that was done about seven years ago with an Assyrian journalist, the wife recalled that as she tried to hold up her husband who had been shot in the doorway, he fell backwards, they fell together, her arm fell under him, and she was trying to talk to him, but his eyes had closed and the blood from his chest was according to her, bubbling as if from a spring. And of course, she panicked, um, tore herself away and ran out into the street, according to the various records and according to herself, screaming and asking for help. Naturally, she was panicked. Now, what had happened looked like a murder with a motive. The victim was not of course, an ordinary person. The victim was the patriarch of the Church of the East. And this story needs to be told fairly by going back in history and understanding the larger context of this murder and the lives of the people involved. What was supposed to happen was that a synod was to, to take place 
with the members of the Church of the East. And the bishops had met in Beirut on September 15, 1973, had stripped Mar Ishe Shimon of his position as patriarch after he had married. The bishops then sent the person who became later a patriarch, Mardoncha IV, um, he was a bishop at the time, to meet with the patriarch. And he had brought a written authorization to meet with the patriarch who had been defrocked. The synod was uh, scheduled initially for November 19, 1975, later rescheduled for January of 1976. There was opposition from various parts of the church in the United States. There were antagonisms within the church against Mar'i Shumun. One must recall that what had taken place was no ordinary event. It was shocking. In fact, today I was looking over some Syrian magazines from the 1970s and one article or reference to the events surrounding the marriage of the patriarch was that there are still, still some people who are, they call them unbelievers, in the fact that the patriarch had married. This was such a shocking event for many Assyrians. They could not come to grips with the fact that uh, the patriarch, a position of held in such esteem, in such reverence, um, a person whose origins, uh, family origins, went back hundreds of years into this hamlet in the Hakari Mountains, and prior to that, um, descendants of leaders of a church ruling this church for about 2,000 years, that someone in this position in this very revered and respected and upheld position in tradition, in custom, could actually succumb to humanity and marry. So many people felt that this was no ordinary event. This was not simply, could not simply be a person just deciding to be married, but it was something much deeper, much more involved than that. Well, was it? We know that the church was threatened with division. And in one issue of Bidnahan magazine, which was published in California in 1975, we were told that the bishops met in Beirut and decided to accept the return of the patriarch to whom the magazine referred at this point because it was after the marriage as Ishe David. Um, we know that Mar Sergis, who was a bishop in the Church of the East, and Mar Daniel had abstained. Almost all committees of the churches in the U.S. are opposed to the patriarch's return. We are told the church in the United States will split from the mother church, from the Church of the East. Mar Aprim of Basra was then sent but presumably with the agreement of other bishops, but not necessarily with the agreement of Mar'i Shumun to the United States. There were rumors that the, and allegations that the Assyrian Universal Alliance were involved in something. The rumor was that members of the Assyrian Universal Alliance had been investigated by their own group, their own organization for taking money from the Iraqi government for propaganda purposes. There was a special hearing held on February 16, 1975 in Flint, Michigan, by the Assyrian Universal Alliance under the leadership of Bill Yonan, who was at that time the head of the AUA. And this hearing was held by the America's chapter. And there were allegations. The allegations were, according to uh, the publication of Bitnaharan and other publications, Assyrian Quest, that there was a receiving of uh, per certain persons had received $4,000 in Paris from an Iraqi security officer, that 
there was uh, 30,000 additional dollars. And that's just to give you an idea, that's about 168 or $170,000 in today's value. There was receiving of monthly salaries alleged. Uh, there was the delivering of the constitution of a secret Assyrian organization, although this is not identified to the Iraqi government. And there were allegations of gathering information on Giorgis Malik Chiku's trip to the United States. I should tell you that Giorgis Malik Chiku was a um, descendant, one of the descendants of Malik Yaqu, and he had fought against the Iraqi government. He is the brother of Hormuz uh, Malik Chiku, who had been a hero of sorts who was for the Assyrians and who had fought against the Iraqi government on the side of the Kurds when the Kurds and the Iraqis were fighting in the 1970s and the 1960s. There was also the allegation that there was an attempt to form a commando unit of Assyrians against the Kurds. So these were the allegations that were made. And then the article in the Bitnahran magazine tells us that it must be pointed out that the AUA tribunal of Flint, as it was called, found the accused two individuals unguilty, I explained not guilty of any wrongdoing due to the lack of documented evidence and an exclamation point. However, sources stated, that the accused individuals themselves admitted some of the charged um, some of the charges levied against them. So the magazine was of the opinion that even though they were not found guilty by their own organization, that the truth was that they themselves had admitted the certain charges. Now in 1975, a few months prior to the night of November 5th, 1975, there was a letter written to the AUA by Malik Giorgis Malik Chiku, and he tells the Assyrian Universal Alliance, specifically Bill Yonan, the head of the Assyrian Universal Alliance, that this is a critical moment for about 300,000 Christians, largely Assyrians, now left hopeless residing in northern part of Iraq in the mountains. During the last 14 years of war between the Kurds and the government of Iraq, Christian inhabitants of this area have been involved in a long, destructive, and brutal war that, and have sacrificed and lost whatever they had. We humbly make this request. Number one, the Iraqi government to extend the ceasefire period to give time to the Assyrians in Iraq to escape to Iran. Number two, to make the government of Iraq to amend the amnesty declared to cover all the inhabitants of Iraq, meaning of among the Kurds and including Assyrians and others such as Yazidis and so on. This was written by Giorgis Malik Chiku and it was published in the Bitnahran magazine. Giorgis Malik Chiku was the head of the, what was called the Kurdistan Christian Committee um, this was a group of Assyrians or Chaldeans, Assyrians and others um, who were fighting on the side of the Peshmergas, being supported at the time, of course, by the United States, Israel and Iran. This was during the time of Kissinger. We're going to talk about that a little bit. This is just to give you kind of an overall, overall view of, of how desperate the situation was for the Assyrians at this time. Uh, where thousands of Assyrians were at risk of being annihilated by the Iraqi government. Now, what had happened for this concern to be expressed by Giorgis Malik Chiku was that the Algiers agreement had taken place. The allegation was that the Iranian government, in order to gain advantage over the Iraqi government, the Iranian government led by the Shah, along with Israel, had convinced the United States to attempt to destabilize Iraq in return for the Iraqis conceding to certain points. We don't need to go into the details of the geographical disputes between the two countries. But the attempt was to destabilize Iraq through the use of the Kurds 
and the Assyrians with them, of course, um, to, to try to pressure the Iraqis so that they would concede to certain demands made by Iran. Israel, of course, had its own interests. And of course, when the rug was, as it were, pulled from under the Kurds and the Assyrians by the United States and by Iran, and the borders were locked, the Iraqi government conducted a full assault on the Kurds. And even though the United States had provided weapons uh, as had Israel and Iran, it was no match for the Iraqi army. And the over 100,000 people were forced to flee. Among them was Mullah Mustafa Barzani, the leader of the Kurdish opposition, along with his family. And uh, Giverg Malik Chiku was one of those who also had to flee and eventually found his way into the United States. Now, again, uh, the bishops, as we said, had met in Beirut. They had accepted the return of the patriarch. There was discussion of a salary. It was approximately $40,500 a year for six years. Uh, informed sources reported that Marsargis, again, and Mardaniel had abstained from this agreement. Now, this was all before, of course, the patriarch was assassinated on that evening in November of 1975. Again, the churches threatened to split from the main church if the patriarch was going to come back as a married uh, patriarch. This was something that, um, that was threatened according to the magazine. And of course, there are various allegations that certain bishops accepted the patriarch's position on marriage. I don't want to go in too deeply into that issue, uh, but that these bishops had accepted the proposal of the patriarch that priests be, or, or excuse me, bishops and presumably patriarchs be allowed to marry because this was a tradition from the Church of the East from long ago, and that that tradition had been forgotten, but that one should accept it being returned again. Now, let's try to understand the personality within the context of what was happening in the past what had happened on that evening through the stages of the life of this very important person in the Church of the East and within the Assyrian nation. We know that he was the boy patriarch in 1920. Uh, he went through very difficult years from 1930 to 1933. He made attempts after he was exiled from Iraq, from the diaspora, to do something about the Assyrian situation specifically. And of course, he was considered not just a church leader, as I've emphasized before in class when it came to this particular position of the patriarch of the Church of the East, unlike, for example, the patriarch of the Syriac Orthodox, the Patriarch of the Syriac Catholics, the Patriarch of the Chaldean Church, the Patriarch of the Church of the East, because of the situation in the Hakkari and the development of the Emirates, the Kurdish Emirates in the Hakkari, and the role that the Patriarch had traditionally played, the Patriarch came to be accepted as a both temporal and religious leader among the Assyrians. I would characterize the years from 1970 to the assassination of the Patriarch in 1975 as one of hope and disappointment. So let's try to understand what happened, how this person became such an important family, such an important leader within the Assyrian uh, family within the Church of the East. Well, in the First World War, Ishe was born in Kuchanus in 1908. He, along with his family, and Marbin Yamin Shumun, his uncle, 
and the patriarch at the time escaped with his people as a refugee. He was age seven. Um, he would obtain safety eventually in Urmi, but there were only four bishops left, Mariosip, Marli Matius, Marsergis, and Marioala. His uncle was assassinated, as we have discussed many times in this class. His other uncle, Marpolis Shimon, um, had taken over from the position of his brother, and he had died uh, at a very young age in 1920. The church was shattered. It was uprooted from its original homelands. It had lost hundreds of churches and hundreds, if not thousands, of villages and hamlets, which meant that its wealth was shattered in addition to having many of its people killed. So unlike any other church at the time, well, perhaps similar to the Syriac Orthodox Church, but certainly it was the probably the most wounded and the most dispossessed church and people at this time, community. And Ishe was a little boy escaping with his people from the Hakkari Mountains into Urmia and later into Iraq. And the state of the churches of the Assyrians was one of disunity and it was one of separation. The Church of the East had its own patriarch, of course, as did the segment of the Church of the East, which had split from it long ago and had become a part of the Catholic Church, had become a unate church in the 1500s, uh, in the Nineveh Plain, later, of course, in the 1600s and, and later in the 1700s. And so there was no cohesion within the larger Assyrian nation, as it were. The Syriac Orthodox and the Syriac Catholics, of course, also had their churches. And these were, at this time, the important institutions, the important gravitational forces that Assyrians gathered around that Assyrians were a part of. There were no political parties, no formal organizations during this time, although there was an attempt to start an Assyrian political party. Assyrian nationalism was very young at this time during the First World War and prior to it. So according to the patriarch's brother, Theodore, Diodorus, as well as Sargon, his younger brother, uh, there was pressure on the patriarchal family to obtain a patriarch from within this family. Uh, Theodore, who was at the time only 14, was first slated to become the patriarch, but he declined. And it was left on the shoulders of um, Ishe, who was a boy of 12 years of age at the time. And if these photographs courtesy of marshamun.com, which is a website that I always recommend, a very important website for the history of the Marshamun family. These photos show a young Marishe Shimon who, is, who has just been consecrated. You could see um, really tragically um, that this boy, although there's a lot of pride there's a lot of tradition behind what has been done, but nevertheless, there was no will, as it were, in this situation when the boy had been made patriarch. Uh, and uh, he is seen in this lower photograph here, awkwardly walking with other bishops and priests supporting him and surrounded by thousands of Assyrians in the Bakuba camp. And I recall a conversation with Sargon Marshamun, who was known as Captain Sargon Marshamun, that the family really did not want, the Marshamun family did not want the patriarchy to remain in their family, but they were forced by other Assyrians because the idea was that 
unless it came from this neutral family, one tribe or another would take the patriarchy and it would be a tipping of the balance against, for example, certain tribes and for certain tribes. So for example, in this instance, the tribes of Tuma and Jilu felt that if the patriarchy were to go to the Tiari <clears throat> um, tribe, it would tip the balance in favor of the Tiari against the Tuma and the Jilu and, and so on. And it would not be a fair situation. Rather than that, there was a balancing factor here considered. This is, of course, speaking from the perspective of tribal leaders at the time, that there was a balancing factor in electing someone from the traditional Marshamun family. And so Ishe was brought to accept the role of the patriarch at this time. And no doubt, this was a heavy, heavy burden. And we are told by Theodore Marshamun in his book that the nation demanded the appointment of another patriarch. However, we did not want one selected from our family again. And this is again reflected in my conversation, my personal conversation years ago with Captain Sargant Marshamun, Malik Khanu of Tchuma, who was attempting to return to our ancestral home, came to us one evening and demanded that a patriarch be ordained from our family. My mother refused, maintaining that it was enough that for, one, uh, for 600 years, the patriarchs had been from this family. She reminded him that during the last past two years, our family mourned the loss of two patriarchs, and that was, of course, Mar Binyamin and Mar Pohres Shimon. She suggested that the church appoint a patriarch from another family, the Malik replied that they would not accept a patriarch outside of the family. He told Lady Esther, my men and I are to return home. If we do not see the patriarchal family ordained, we shall not go. Neither Colonel Owen nor the government can force us to leave. Now, the British had reportedly told the Assyrians not to select or choose a patriarch at this time, but the Assyrians had not uh, accepted this. And so... Um, so it was forced upon Ishe to become a patriarch. Now, immediately the reaction was not a favorable one from certain quarters, although Mario Sabhananishu, who was a metropolitan, to the left, upper left picture, Mario Sip, who is a saint of the church now of the East, um, accepted the consecration, it was part of the consecration. Marti Matius, in the middle picture to the right, seated with, with uh, Mar Ishe Shimon, did not initially accept. And, and he said, if this Ishe, quite a simple child, is made patriarch, we will never accept him as such until and unless it has convinced us that he is made patriarch according to the canons and customs of our church at present and that he is acceptable by all our congregation and nation in general. And I should say that Martli Matius was a metropolitan, which is of course higher than a bishop at the time. And he challenged the church and there was a lot of back and forth between himself and members of the Marshamun family, uh, more specifically Surmachanam, who is to the um, lower picture there to the left. And eventually there were attempts to make amends between Martli Matius, who is also, by the way, made saint in the Church of the East. I was recently informed of that. I had not known that. Um, he was certainly a contentious uh, person with the church because of his disagreements um, in one letter, he tells, when he is accused of rabble-rousing, he tells it, the uh, family that, you know, it is you who trounce upon the canons of the church and toss them, rip them apart from the books and toss them into the air, not I. So there were a lot of these <clears throat> correspondence that went back and forth, and we still have these today. 
very difficult period for the Assyrian people, very difficult period for the Assyrian church and, and a lot of people basically in conflict with each other over what to do, how to do it, who to select to do it, and so on. Eventually, Marti Matius accepts the patriarch and, um, and actually makes arrangements for him, helps make arrangements for him to go to England. And we know that when he left to England to obtain education, there he is uh, as a young patriarch in England, we are told that by one certain um, a priest, Canon Douglas, uh, who got to know him, that in 1924, when he entered St. Augustine's College in Canterbury, he studied for about a year and then attended Westcott House at Cambridge, where he spent a further year. He chose to remain with the Canon Mason, and we are told, quote, he would stay out to 10 or 11 p.m., but never made a fool of himself or forgot his duties as a patriarch. This is according to Canon Douglas. And we were also told in various literature that he was a very athletic young man, that he was a halfback in rugby, that he had, according to his brother Sargon, uh, the late Sargon Marshallman, that he had achieved a certain record in athleticism that remained unbroken as of the time that Sargon had visited England and, uh, and has spoken to people who knew Marishe Shumun when he was a youth in England. There's a picture of where the patriarch had gone in England. Now, when he had returned to Iraq, and was a young man who was about 20. He was confronted with the very difficult situation of the British leaving Iraq in a different state than the Assyrians had originally envisioned when Iraq's mandate was ending in 1932. The Assyrians were very concerned and the patriarch was very concerned, along with other members of uh, the leadership of the Assyrians, to do something because the Assyrians had fought and had just experienced what came to be known as the genocide, uh, which devastated the church, and were thinking things were going to get worse unless arrangements are made. And others within the Assyrian nation looked to the patriarch. Again, this position was not simply one of a religious leadership. It was also a position of secular leadership, looked to the patriarch for assistance. And he stepped forward and he was a very energetic and passionate uh, person for the cause of the Assyrians. Unlike, again, any other patriarch among his people. So the head of the Chaldean church, the head of the Syriac Orthodox church, and the head of the um, Syriac Catholic church, for example. He was the sole patriarch whose mission was not simply religious, but also um, one that was secular and temporal. And so demands were made on the government of Iraq, on the kingdom of Iraq, that the Assyrians should be recognized as a nation, now you may ask, well, what's a patriarch doing, attempting to get a government to recognize his people as a nation rather than simply accepting the fact that he had been a church leader? Again, this has to do with his position um, in terms of the customs of how it was viewed by his own people. His people looked to him not only as a religious leader, but also as their secular and uh, secular leader and savior, and so they had no one else to turn to but Marishe Shumun. And he is the sole person in Iraq at the time. There is no other leader arguing these positions, arguing for a comprehensive position. He's not seeking merely a position for himself 
or a small arrangement. He is seeking to settle a national issue, unlike any other leader among the Assyrians. And by the way, I should say that oftentimes even his friends would have attempted to dissuade him, and they will continue to attempt to dissuade him from trying to do something comprehensive like this, because this is not simply a, an easy ask of the Iraqi government or the British. This is a very difficult ask. It is certainly a very comprehensive solution to the Assyrian plight. The other patriarchs are not asking for anything. In fact, they're very quiet during this time. They're silently watching what Mari Shimon does, and he refuses to concede to the Iraqi demands. And of course, unfortunately for the Assyrians, unfortunately for the patriarch, unfortunately for the movement that he led, King Faisal refuses. And King Faisal very craftily makes good or forms good relations with other church leaders, gains their trust, gains their support, and in a typical divide and conquer procedure and tactic, the Christians in Iraq do not come together. They are split apart, and Marshamun is isolated. And the next step would be to isolate him further from even members of his own church by getting people to, in effect, turn against him, turn against his demands, turn against his desires and the desires of uh, others surrounding him and supporting him for a final solution, as it were, to the Assyrian um, problem in Iraq. Tensions build within Iraq and the patriarchal family is eventually forced into exile. The Semele massacre occurs. We're not going to go into detail of the Semele massacre. That's not the point of this class, but it's important to know the context here of what was happening around the patriarch. Uh, this is a horrible time for the Assyrians and the patriarch along with others, documented the killing of thousands of Assyrians, including many priests who had given up really their, their weapons, surrendered their weapons, and were nevertheless slaughtered by the Iraqi government. The patriarch is exiled. He is sent away. The impact on the larger Assyrian community or the Christian community is a devastating one. The Syriac Orthodox Marafram Barsoum, who had previously supported Assyrian nationalism, had been a participant in the Paris Peace Conference, had called for the creation of a solution that was comprehensive for his people, for the Assyrian people, um, now does not want anything to do with the Church of the East, does not want anything to do, in fact, with the name Assyrian. And he tells us in a leaflet that the Assyrian name is an English Protestant invention going back to 1900. It was bequeathed to the Nestorians. Again, he wants to distance himself from a segment of his people. It was bequeathed to the Nestorians in the region of Mosul, 1919, 1920, for a malicious purpose. The Syrians have no interest whatsoever in taking to themselves this strange name, even though he had himself accepted it. The sufferings of the Nestorians have endured as a result of their nationalism. So let's learn from them. Let's stay away from nationalism. And if Jacobites, he calls his people, wish to avoid the same fate, they should disassociate themselves from the Assyrian nationalist activity. Marafram Barsoum at one point became to Arabs a heroic figure, and he was known as Qas al Aruba or Qas al Zaman, uh, as the Arabs called him. Mar Yosef Emmanuel, the head of the Chaldean church, at first had advocated 
to the King Crane Commission, the creation of an Assyrian uh, Chaldean homeland, again, also backed up, changed his mind and turned against the efforts that were being advocated by Marshamun. This was a frightening time for Christians in general. And at one point, uh, Marios of Emmanuel tells a British official that the, our situation is made more difficult because of Marshamun's demands that he should really have conceded. And he made things difficult for all of us as Christians, because there was a concern that not only this would entail a political movement on the part of the Iraqi government against and those that, that gathered to support the Iraqi government, but it, but it would become a religious holy war, as it were. There was this concern against the entire Christian population of Iraq, and so everyone would suffer. So better to step away from the desires of those who have been targeted now by both the Iraqi government as well as not necessarily the British directly, but the British stood by and allowed the situation to happen. In fact, assisted it because they had their own interests in Iraq. Now, from this period, Assyrians begin to form these secret societies, what Marshamun had called for, which was really directly in the line of what Benjamin Arsanis, Freydun Aturaya, and others had called for in Urmi, that we be considered a distinct people, that we are a distinct people, we have our own culture, we have our heritage, we're not merely Christians. Other organizations stepped into the uh, field of collective activity here. Among them was Khet Khet Allab, which is Khubba uh, Khuyada Aturaya, which means Assyrian love and unity. It was an informal organization. Nothing written that I have seen, uh, but they also were the people behind, likely behind, the request to the American officials, again, that we may be considered a separate and distinct people which joined the allies in both wars and made great sacrifices, losing its potential, its uh, political autonomous status. And so can you please help us gain it back? This was a plea to the Americans. And what Marshamun had left or ha was, was forced exiled from Iraq, he did not give up on requesting for his people and felt that in 1945, with the formation of, of course, the, the League of Nations had ended. There was the formation of the United Nations. Marshamun felt that this was a great opportunity for Assyrians to possibly gain again. And as we are told by Professor Coakley, that many friends of Marshamun turned against him and attempted to dissuade him from continuing to fight for his people in this way, feeling that he should be much more comfortable in trying to preserve his church rather than trying to find a solution, a temporal secular solution to the plight of the Assyrian people. But he tells the United Nations in his famous letter that the Assyrians are a people who existed in the Middle East from the dawn of history. Assyria is their home. And by reason of history, they have an undisputed right to their survival as a people in that home. He tells them about the involvement of the Assyrians in the First World War, their dedication to the allied cause. If such a home were granted, he tells the United Nations, granted them under an international organization that is to be set up, they would congregate in that home, which would enable them to live free from want and fear and to preserve their Christian faith, their language, and their ancient culture. Now, again, it's important to emphasize that this was unique among the churches in the East, that Marshamun was, again, attempting to resurrect his role, although in the diaspora, attempting to resur resurrect a role of a political leader, trying to find a comprehensive solution for his people. 
that was 1945. This is now 1948. Marisha Shimon changes his policy and begins to move in a different direction. He has become, one could say, much more realistic, less idealistic, less seeking a larger comprehensive solution that is direct and is possibly going to ruffle the feathers of various nations in the Middle East. And he is rather seeking to take a more diplomatic, perhaps a low-key role. And as he does this, the opposition against him in certain places uh, also uh, grows, specifically something called the Assyrian Liberation Committee of Hasekah from 1948 to 1949, leveled allegations of corruption. These allegations, of course, um, well, they are allegations, and they're oftentimes, you know, back and forth. Uh, various parties will allege this or that against each other. There is no trial that I can tell you that was had where we can look at documents and uh, very carefully. And of course, you know, even documents themselves do not tell the whole story. We're, we're left with a an issue that is not resolved because when you look at a document, you must also remember that that document is created by a human being. It is not in and of itself a sacred tablet written by you know, uh, divine forces. So these are allegations that go back and forth, unfortunately, between Assyrians. Again, in very difficult times, with difficult circumstances, and with people who are pressured by events. And so Marshaman is trying at this time to shift his policy. And rather than confront and demand, he is trying to make amends and trying to open doors in various Middle Eastern countries. He's seated here at a later time with the Shah of Iran, um, where he visited in 1963, and seven years later, he is to visit Iraq. Now, in 1958, the Iraqi revolution happens. The government that had been in charge in Somalia falls. The Kingdom of Iraq falls. This brings fears and hopes to the Assyrians. Abdul Karim Qasim is recognized um, by Assyrians, uh, recognizes Assyrians in his speeches. He is here seen visiting an Assyrian church with Mariosip and Mar Sergis. Mar Yosip is the metropolitan who is really in charge of the Church of the East in Iraq. Mar Yosef is much less a secular person, unlike the patriarch. He does not really espouse any political. He has, his, of course, his sympathies uh, for his people, his community, his nation, but he is not one to espouse a position or a demand that is um, uh, requested of the, of the Iraqi government. Now, Assyrians begin to form different organizations in Iraq, uh, various organizations. The church is not the only kind of gravitational force at this time. Various organizations form in Iraq, and uh, they are social and political. But there is also further conflict in the church. In 1960, uh, Marshaman has a conflict with Martuma Darmu. Uh, 1964, Marshaman suspends Martuma Darmu. And four years later, the faction headed by Martuma Darmu splits. He becomes patriarch of what we know as the ancient Church of the East. Now, I don't want to get into, there are many of these letters that go back and forth again accusations, counter-accusations, allegations, counter-allegations between Martuma Darmu and the supporters of Marisha Shimon, his priests, even himself, that one side is corrupt, 
And, and of course, again, there are documents to support various sides. It's not time to get into this issue at this time. The Assyrian Universal Alliance also is created in 1968, adding a further layer to the various organizations that are created in an attempt to bring together the Assyrian people. This is a major effort by, that is supported by Assyrians throughout the world, but it really begins from the Assyrians of Iran and it spreads into Iraq it spreads to the United States and to other countries in Europe as well. This is a time when Assyrians were also engaged with the Kurds, largely struggling against the Iraqi government. One of those is one of those leaders of uh, the Assyrians is Hormuz Malik Chikku, the other is uh, Margaret. Um, Giorgis, who is seen to the right here, she becomes a kind of an iconic figure for the Kurds as a, a female fighter. Some consider her a, a Christian Kurd, but of course she was an Assyrian, and she's later assassinated by the Kurds themselves in 1969. There are various allegations against various people within the Kurdish movement as to who done it, uh, but no definite uh, person has been convicted or prosecuted for this crime, of course. Now, we're understanding the larger situation here. While we're going through a difficult time in the church, while there are these issues within the church leadership, the Assyrians are undergoing a very difficult time in Iraq vis-a-vis -vis the Iraqi government, vis-a-vis -vis the Kurds. In 1970, Marshimun visits Iraq, and this becomes a major period where hope uh, grows in the Assyrian community, and various people in the community in Iraq feel that there, this is a, even though Marshimun at this time, his vision is really much more diplomatic, uh, much less demanding of the Iraqi government. They feel that nevertheless, he is a type of a savior for them and that he is, even though he is, his position is not stated as a leader, a secular leader who is going to find a solution for his people, that he is symbolically going to advocate for something. So on April 24th, 1970, he came to Iraq two weeks prior to the signing of the Kurdish Autonomy Accords. As we said, he's hailed as a savior of Assyrians. Um, though he met with Iraqi leaders, there is no definite agreement that was formed. And of course, Samir al-Khalil, who is Kanaan Makiya in his book, The Republic of Fear, uh, tells us that the official record of Marshimun's visit defies commentary, meaning we don't know what it led to, we don't know which way it went. We're not sure whether it was successful, whether it was not successful. He leaves Iraq, and of course, there are various versions of what Marshamun was trying to do when he visited Iraq at this time, what the Iraqi government's expectations were of, of Marshamun and the Assyrians at this time. Very important to understand that the Assyrian people themselves read this visit as a transformative one. This was a very important and hopeful sign for themselves, for their people in Iraq, for the Assyrian community. And there were even songs to honor uh, Marshamun's arrival in Baghdad. One of them was sung by Albert Temras, who says in his song, one line in the song, asks the mother to take off the black, in other words, end the mourning uh, of the nation. Tell mother to take off the black because good times are coming. And 
there was, one could describe, euphoria among many Syrians as Marshamun visited the various communities throughout Iraq and Baghdad and Kirkuk and Mosul, other places. He even visited Tikrit to see the ancient church there. One of the poems written by Shamashi Giverges Benyamin of Ashitha tells us that welcome our great shepherd, our patriarch, our crown, bless before you great and small in this day as you bless our throngs. Our entire nation was awaiting, again, this anticipation of something that is going to happen. This joyous day and from the Lord, and from the Lord that he bless Mahlila to sweeten such a time for us. This was sung by the church choir in Baghdad. And one must remember that the Ba'athists were in charge in Iraq. The Ba'athist Socialist Arab Party was a nationalist party. So much of what was said was very symbolic too on the part of the Assyrian people. So um, our entire nation was awaiting, says something. And we are told that as Marshamun sat and listened to many of these songs, he, one of the songs he listened to was Tani Li Lailai, which is Tell Me a Lullaby, which is a nationalistic song written by Freydun Aturaya. As he is listening, many in the audience um, could see that he was, as he heard the lines of the song and saw the throngs around him, that he became very emotional and uh, shed tears, uh, perhaps in sadness um, of the plight of his people, uh, perhaps because he was joyous. One doesn't know, but he was observed crying as he listened to these lines, silenced Assyria, you still possess supporters, you still have sons, you have me, I will grow on the soil of Nineveh and die without fear as an Assyrian, young men arise, stand in the field to battle for the nation of Assyria. In Iraq, the Iraqi government under decree 281 declared Marshamun as the recognized head of what was called as the Ta'ifa Athuriya, the Assyrian sect. One must remember that the Assyrians, although demands were made in, 19, in the 1930s that we be recognized not merely as a church, but as a nation. The fact is that the Iraqi government never quite recognized during this time the Assyrians as a nation, certainly not on the same plane as the Kurds and others, not as the Arabs, of course, but they did recognize them as a ta'ifa, ta'ipa in, in Assyrian, which is a perhaps best translation would be a sect or a denomination but the word Assyrian was used. So there were cultural activities during this time. Um, there were laws passed. The government passed the law to recognize cultural rights of Assyrians, but it was under the term Nataqeen Billugha Syriania, which is speakers of the Syriac language. And of course, there are various allegations that the Iraqi government really never meant as it did with the Kurds later, never meant to give them these rights, but it was really uh, no more than ink on paper, as it were. So uh, this was the declaration, um, and uh, there were to be magazines, and Assyrians were supporters of this, but of course, nothing materialized from this. Now, something called the Assyrian National Committee in 1973 also visited Iraq along with the AUA. It was headed by Malik Yaqu, who had, Malik Yaqu had this persona, this charisma, that he was in this very important tribal and national position, and he was respected as a leader among Assyrians. The AUA members namely Sam Andrews and Zaya Smile had accompanied him, the son of Malik Yaqu. 
a petition was presented to the Iraqi government based on the Kurdish autonomy agreement written in Iraq. Saddam had apparently had the final word and had allegedly said Iraq is one house and one family and that Iraq would not be split into more than one house. In other words, no to any legitimate autonomy concerns on the part of the Assyrians. But no official response to that petition ever came in writing. It was said that uh, Nazim Kazar, who was later killed within the Ba'ath Party, who was a chief of security, was favorable to the Assyrians, but he was outside. Uh, um, he was ousted after a failed coup attempt, and Malik Yaqub dies in 1974. Now back to the murder in 1975. The trial takes place in San Jose. The assassin of Marshamun Marishay Shumun is David Malik Ismail, who happens to be the son of Malik Yaqub, who had been a supporter of Marshamun for many, many years. Marshamun is shot three times in the chest after allegedly there is an argument and we we're going to go through the trial transcripts in a um, rather quick way and as i comment on the trial i'm going to also tell you um, later what the prosecutor told me when i talked to him i was really lucky to get a hold of mr robinson who is an elderly gentleman now he's no longer practicing law but he recalled this trial of uh, the assassination of Marishe Shumun. Mardanha, in reporting, and Mardanha becomes the patriarch of the Church of the East after the assassination of Mar Shumun. As you know, His Holiness Marishe Shumun, Catholicos Patriarch of the Church of the East, was killed on Thursday, November 5th. And the reason for his murder was political not his marriage, a great loss for our nation and church. He tells us. He writes this in a private letter to Maraprim, or excuse me, to Maraprim and Marnase uh, on December 5th, 1975, after arriving in the United States. Now, what happened? Based on the trial records, this is the best that we have to delve into the facts of the case. One of those testifying was the wife of Marisha Shimon, who testified that on November 5th, she had received three or four phone calls from someone with an Assyrian accent who um, was asking for a wrong number and that her husband felt that the person was checking to see whether he was home or not. And of course, Mar Shimon at this time, after all of his experiences, becomes very concerned. The next questions were asked of um, Imam Marshamun referred to David Ismail and various conversations she had with him. She testified that she had never heard of him, uh, never heard him discuss religion, only politics, that he was not really interested in religious matters. She confirmed in her testimony that a member of the Assyrian Universal Alliance in Chicago had come to see the patriarch and encouraged them to give up his spiritual leadership and assume political leadership, but that the patriarch had declined and stated that he did not want to be involved in political organizations of any kind. Imam Marshamun stated that the man's first name she knew to be Sergis and believed that his last name was Michaels. Now, I knew Sergis Michaels, um, and he was not a member of the AUA, actually. He was a nationalist Assyrian who had revered Marshamun a great deal. And he recounted to me the meeting he had with Marshamun. So there definitely was a meeting between Sergis Michael and Marshamun. And that he, was, he had been shocked that the patriarch had been married, but that believed that the patriarch was really the only person who could do something about the Assyrian situation and had gone to see him after many repeated attempts to do so. 
the patriarch apparently had declined to be involved. And Sergius Michael told me personally that the patriarch seemed not to be himself, as it were. This was his view, of course. Um, there was no further discussion about what that meant. She testified further, the wife of Marshimun, that a meeting between the bishops of the church and the patriarch were scheduled in Seattle for November of 1975, but it had been postponed to January. And she testified that the patriarch had confided to her that he was afraid someone was plotting against him. And this is something that was repeated by others as well. She testified that they were eating dinner and that he had gone, she had gone upstairs to bathe the baby, um, the son, and to put him to bed. It was about 6.30 p.m. and the patriarch had gone to the kitchen to prepare their evening coffee when they used to sit and discuss things after uh, the baby was put to bed. And she heard him scream her name twice. There was shuffling noise as if later she describes furniture going back and forth and him screaming as if he had never uh, screamed before. It was something she describes as almost earth shattering that the whole house shook. She had never heard him scream before like this. And she heard three shots. She said that she had been told by the patriarch that if her name was called twice, she were to lock herself and the baby in a room and call for help. But she rushed down to see what had happened to her husband. She stated that she had seen no one through the glass portion of the door, nor through the windows, uh, through the drapes. She did say later that she ran outside and saw someone running away and that even when she was screaming, um, the expectation was the person would turn around to see what was going on, but she, she saw this person continue to run. And, and other, there's other testimony outside of the trial that other people had seen this person run from the house. Another person that testified was Mr. Yuwa Lazar, who had been a member of the AUA. He testified that he met Mr. Smile for coffee several times before November 3rd to 6th and that on the afternoon of November 3rd, he had lent Mr. Ismail his car. Mr. Ismail, of course, was from Canada. He was not from the United States. Mr. Lazar was then questioned as to who, as to whether he knew Mr. Ismail had a gun, and his reply was this, that he did not know, and that the matter of guns was not discussed between him and Mr. Ismail. This testimony, of course, is going to be controverted later. Mr. K Ms. Kitty Benjamin, who was associated with the AUA, stated that she and Mr. Ismail had not discussed politics, but that the Assyrian Universal Alliance had come up in the course of a conversation. Now, we have to stop here and, and understand what's this discussion of the Assyrian Universal Alliance? What's, this is heading towards some kind of conspiracy that this is not really a one person acting alone here on his own. He just simply arrives from Canada and he does this kind of thing. So the prosecutor is opening up through testimony, the involvement of various other peoples, uh, various other people towards what end exactly. She said that she is not a member of the organization, but is planning to join in. She also indicated that Mr. Smile um, is not a member of the AUA and that several times he had told her that he was not interested in politics and wanted nothing to do with politics. But then Miss Kitty Benjamin's testimony is um, countered with some evidence, a Christmas card that was presented to the court and marked People's Exhibit number 29. Ms. Benjamin identified the handwriting on the card as hers and said that she had sent to the card to Mr. Smile in Canada, dated December 14, 1973, so sometime prior to the murder. Quote, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Love, Kitty Benjamin. God bless you and keep up the good work. Uh, up for the AUA, end of quote. She then 
when confronted with this evidence, written evidence, she said that they are a peaceful political group. They are also concerned with the Assyrian culture and heritage of which I am very proud and I want to work for this cause. Assyrians from any religion, denomination or organization belong to the AUA. They belong to more than one organization, but most of the Assyrians belong to the AUA. It is an organization that is uniting our people throughout the world. So she restates in effect what the goal of the AUA was. And of course, the AUA becomes a central concern. But does this for the prosecution lead anywhere? Testimony of Larry Joe Crowley, who was in the hotel. He tells us this very strange observation that between midnight and 1 a.m., around the time of the murder or prior to the murder, Mr. Crowley saw a government interagency car, not sure which one it is, pull into the parking lot directly behind the car in space number 10. Mr. Crowley watched the car as it could have been blocking another car's exit from the parking lot. Two men wearing a khaki, khaki uniforms got out of the car and went into room one. After 10 or 15 minutes, they got into their car and left. Mr. Crowley saw Mr. Benjamin. Now, this is what he calls Mr. Smile, who is registered as Mr. Benjamin by Kitty Benjamin. Accompany them to the car. He then went back to his room shortly thereafter. Another car pulled into the parking lot and a man in a suit got out and went to unit one. He stayed there about 10 or 15 minutes and then came out with Mr. Benjamin and both left in the car. Very strange events. No one could quite figure out what was going on here, who these personalities were with Mr. Ismail at this time. Fred Qaleta testified. Fred Qaleta was married to the sister of Marshamun. He told the court that he had met the defendant's father, General Ismail, and that, and that's of course, General Ismail is Maliki Yaqo Ismail, and that the general was loved and respected by the patriarch, although the patriarch did not always agree with his political activities, meaning with Maliki Yaqo's political activities. The patriarch had mentioned that he felt General Ismail's or Malik Ismail's political involvement were brought on by his sons. He also testified that he knew a man named Sergis Michael, who wrote articles for a newspaper, the Assyrian Star, a magazine, and that Mr. Michael had contacted him for an appointment with the patriarch and that the patriarch had finally consented to see Mr. Michaels. Mr. Michaels wanted the patriarch to be both a spiritual leader and a political leader of the Assyrian people. But the patriarch, of course, as we know, since 1948, believed that the church should not be involved in politics. Patriarch had not supported the AUA because the AUA did not have the support from the Assyrian people in the Middle East, according to Fred Qaleta. After his marriage, the Patriarch had received Bishop Mardenha, Bishop Mar Claudio, Father Bernie of Seattle, and several, several other priests. The Patriarch had resigned his office at the beginning of 1973, and after talking with the bishops, agreed to stay on for six more months so that another Patriarch could be elected. However, the bishops were confused, and immediately after the patriarch's marriage, they gathered in Lebanon and decided to reinstate the patriarch. And, and I should say that there was conflict between the patriarch and the bishops. <clears throat> Without going into much detail, he felt that they reneged on certain statements made to him and uh, that caused much consternation on his part and, and, of course, presumably on their part as well. So they wrote a letter asking him to come back and sent it to the patriarch with their representative. The question was to have been settled in Seattle in January of 1976. Of course, that gathering never took place. Well, what about the person who committed this crime? What did he have to say at trial? And he had said that he had known Ms. Imama Shumun and her family and had visited them since 1969, perhaps twice a year. He also stated that 
at that time he was too busy earning a living and uh, to be interested in politics and teaching his son politics. He had become very upset when he learned of the patriarch's marriage in 1973, something that really reflected many Assyrians uh, view of, of what had happened, as I said before, uh, even within the Marshamun family, of course, one should say that there was much opposition to this. And I'll say more about that later. And it affected him so much that he couldn't work. He had telephoned his father in Beirut, Lebanon, and had flown there to see his father. He said that his father was reluctant to discuss the patriarch's marriage. Again, this was a very difficult subject for many Assyrians who were grappling with, with this issue. And he had seemed very changed, meaning his father. He did not remember whether he rang the bell or knocked on the door. The door was opened by Marshamun, the patriarch, and Mr. Ismail knelt and kissed the patriarch's hand, according to his testimony. The patriarch let Mr. Ismail into the house and they walked briefly. Uh, they talked briefly, excuse me, about the Assyrians in Canada, where Mr. Ismail was from, but also Iraq and Syria during the conversation. Mr. Ismail tells us that he said to the patriarch, Gessi, an Assyrian term for um, a position of reverence, such as a patriarch or a bishop, Gessi, don't come back again because most of the people, they don't like the patriarch to get married or be married. You are retired now. Mr. Ismail stated that when he, he was extremely nervous and shaking for having spoken to the patriarch in this way. And the patriarch got very upset and asked him to leave. He stated also that the patriarch had slapped and kicked him and spat in his face and that he had fallen down after this. He also stated that the patriarch said some bad things about his father, Malik Yaqub Ismail. Um, he then testified that he doesn't remember what happened after that. Presumably he's lost. Um, he lost consciousness or blacked out, as it were. This is a photograph of David Ismail, who's since passed away with his wife and Marisha Shimon at better times earlier when better relations were, uh, were had. We don't know the exact date of this photograph. Mr. Ismail testified further that he remembered having the gun uh, with him, but that it wasn't loaded because he never carried a loaded gun. He did not remember shooting the gun. He then testified that he had vague memories. I remember as a dream, I see one officer and that is all. I think my hands on the wall, some wall, someplace. I remember see one lady and she said something about my suit. I don't know what she said. So he's trying to recollect what he was remembering. I wasn't paying attention. I don't know what she was doing. That's all. Before that, I remember sitting beer in front of me. I don't know where. So these are his memories of when he was at the time he was arrested at the place. So he, he is claiming um, truthfully or falsely that he does not remember. Um, had not heard of the AUA until sometime in October when he had signed up to become a member. He had heard that it was an organization designed to unite the Assyrian people. Mr. Ismail also said that he had not been angry with the patriarch personally or any of the members of his family, that he had not planned to shoot the patriarch and had not been paid to do it. However, he could not accept that the patriarch had called his father a bad name and quote, I just got upset. I don't know what happened to me, what I lost everything I had. There was a cross examination by the prosecutor, attorney Robinson. Mr. Smile testified that he thought he was, it was a little unusual for a stranger. He asked him about the gun. Where did you get the gun? For a stranger in a bar to offer it. He said, somebody offered it to me um for twenty dollars so he bought it he testified that he did not mention this to mr lazar mr Yuel lazar earlier 
as he did not know Mr. Laza that well. He again stated that he did not get involved with the Assyrian Universal Alliance until October of 1975, meaning a month prior to the murder, and that since his brothers were involved, Kitty Benjamin had probably thought that he was involved too, and had mentioned it to in her Christmas card to him. Miss, Mr. Ismail also testified that he did not attend church service on Sunday because they were over when Mr. Lazar dropped them off at the church. What you gather from the various testimonies is that, that, that there are various people involved here that certainly, without question, all the evidence, whether circumstantial or even direct evidence, shows that there were various people involved with Mr. Ismail, that he certainly was not acting alone in this case. And the prosecutor pointed out that Mr. Ismail had testified earlier that when he was going to see somebody important, he wouldn't bring his gun. But if he were seeing friends, he would carry the gun. When asked why he was carrying the gun that night, he went to see the patriarch's house. He said that he didn't decide to go there until after dinner. A psychologist was presented who testified that testing shows an organic impairment, a brain dysfunction that would make him, the defendant, more likely to lose emotional control than a normal person. This would probably make him more vulnerable to intoxicants such as alcohol. As well, his emotional intensity when out of control could lead to violence or death. In addition to Mr. Ismail, who had committed the murder, the, there were priests who testified, specifically two priests from the Church of the East, Archdeacon Ninos Michael of San Francisco, at one time had been the Patriarch's secretary, and in August of 1973, uh, had accompanied the Patriarch, and they had uh, picked up the Patriarch's wife, <clears throat> excuse me, at the, at the uh, airport, he testified also that um, of the patriarch's intention to marry, he testified that while he was staying at a hotel in this, in a particular, uh, at a particular time and made a call to his wife, the patriarch had come into the room and had started getting upset because he felt that the priest had told his wife about the uh, upcoming marriage and had insulted him, meaning the patriarch had insulted the, the priest. However, after uh, Archdeacon uh, Ninos Michael had assured the patriarch that he had not told his wife about the marriage, so obviously this was a concern, according to the priest, the patriarch had calmed down. He also testified that on another occasion, the patriarch became very angry with him and shouted at him, for talking about a private conversation and that the patriarch was also angry with him for giving his wife the telephone number of the motel where they were staying. Reverend Michael said that he had performed the patriarch's marriage ceremony because he was ordered to do so by the patriarch and had to obey him, but that he did not do it willingly. Obviously, according to Reverend Ninos Michael, he was very uncomfortable throughout the whole affair. Reverend Ephraim Dibaz, who's since passed away in, in uh, a few years ago in Illinois, also testified he had been a priest in the Church of the East for about 18 years and had first come to the United States in 1961. He had met the patriarch at the time. He also knew General uh, or Malik Ismail, Malik uh, Yaqo Ismail, the defendant's father, and the defendant and had seen both of them at the patriarchs in the patriarchs presence and and we did of course see uh, david ismail with the patriarch at an earlier time reverend debaz testified that twice he had seen the patriarch lose his temper and this 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 description of the patriarch is repeated again and again of him losing his temper that he was impatient at times and then one, on one occasion, the patriarch had slapped him uh, with an envelope and called him a, a jackass in Assyrian. This is according to his testimony. And that on, on a second occasion, the patriarch had become very angry with another priest and had insulted him. He also testified that he knew that General Smile 
had always supported the patriarch. The priest also testified that he had never, and by the way, Reverend DeVaz was the brother of Bishop um, or Metropolitan uh, DeVaz, uh, Narse, Mar Narse DeVaz, who was the bishop in Lebanon and was known as the Matropolitat Atur of Assyria. Reverend DeVaz also testified that he had never made a statement to the effect that he would get even with the patriarch this, because this was an allegation. Uh, because he had transferred him from Chicago to Michigan. Reverend DeBas stated that he arrived at the San Francisco airport through United Airlines on the evening of March 28th. He was alone. He had been met by Kitty Benjamin. And when he and Kitty got to the car, Zaya Smile was waiting for them. Reverend DeBas admitted to having sent a telegram in early February of 1975, which spoke against the patriarch. He's then admitted to knowing Sam Andrews of the AUA, and that Sam Andrews and Zaya Smile were friends. The priest also had seen David Ismail and Bishop Hamas in July of 1975, and that it had been in church, not at the Sheraton Hotel, as was the testimony of a, an Assyrian lawyer, an Assyrian American lawyer. He knew David Ismail often carried a gun, and that he had known Mr. Ismail. Uh, since he was a child of seven in Syria. Reverend DeBaz had seen Mr. Ismail also on October 30th, 1975 in Chicago and had invited him and his uncle and cousin to the home for tea after church. Politics and church business had not been discussed, nor had the patriarch, according to Reverend DeBaz. He stated that he was familiar with the AUA and that the AUA is working, quote, for the welfare of the Assyrian community Assyrian nation all over the world to keep the culture, language, and customs of the Assyrians, and they have been very helpful to our people all over, from Russia to Egypt to Syria to the United States, end of quote. He also stated that he and Zaya Smile were close friends, but that he knew nothing of Zaya's political beliefs. He said that he did not know Yuwil Lazar, who was in the AUA, but that he had uh, heard of him from reading the Assyrian Star. He then stated he felt the patriarch had always managed to live in a place that was too lavish for a clergyman and that he had always seemed to be too interested in raising money. And this type of allegations, by the way, went back and forth against uh, Reverend DeBaz as well. And that the parishioners were distrustful of him. Reverend DeBaz stated again that he believed the judgment was left to God. He then stated that he had not attended the patriarch's funeral. Zaya Ismail also testified and stated that he was never charged with being a spy for the government of Iraq because this was a, an issue that several magazines had discussed, as we said earlier. However, on February 16, 1975, in Flint, Michigan, the council members of the AUA informed Zaya Ismail and Sam Andrews that they were accused of taking money from the Iraqi government for their expenses during their stay in Baghdad. At the time, they, they and Zaya's father, the late Malik Yaqu, had been guests of the Iraqi government. Now, what was the role of the AUA in all of this? According to the trial testimony, Mr. Sam Andrews had testified. He testified that he lived in Chicago. He testified that he had known David Ismail since 1969. He also knew David's father, Malik uh, Yaqo Ismail, and had acted as an advisor to him and accompanied him wherever he traveled abroad, more specifically Iraq. Sam Andrews had, been, had seen the patriarch on three occasions. The first was in Chicago in 1968, when the patriarch met with the president and then the vice president of the Assyrian American National Federation. Mr. Andrews testified that the Patriarch had written a letter to be signed by the President of the Federation and sent to the representatives of Muslim governments within uh, in the United States, inviting them to a meeting to discuss incidents in Iraq. The President had felt the letter was too strong and refused to sign it, but that the Patriarch had insisted on it, that it be sent the way it was, 
and had started screaming at them and had thrown them out of his hotel room, meaning the patriarch. He then told the court that he's a member of the AUA and had joined when it was organized in 1968. He had been an executive member for three years and the last two years, he had been the chairman of the advisory board. He's presented a sealed copy of the bylaws of the AUA to the court, which were marked defendants exhibit O and an accompanying letter was marked exhibit N. Sam Andrews stated that the patriarch had always preached to the people of the, ch at the people uh, of the church of the East should live in peace, wherever the governments, wherever the people were living and is uh, devoted to helping underprivileged Assyrian people. The AUA has quote, an aim that the Assyrian, that the Assyrians like uh, any other nationality under the constitution and charter of the United Nations should have an area to live in and an autonomous state under the jurisdiction of the central government of that country. Several letters dealing with the World Council of Churches, the United Nations and the State Department when they're presented uh, to the court and marked exhibit P. Mr. Robertson then conducted a cross-examination of Sam Andrews. Sam Andrews was called for cross-examination. After much discussion, Mr. Andrews acknowledged that he was familiar with the newspaper. There was a lot of back and forth at the trial called the Assyrian Quest, which was published in Chicago and was distributed throughout the Assyrian community in the United States. He stated that he did, did recall an article called the AUA cover-up scandal, what happened in Flint, Michigan, and that the article was twisted and biased and completely untrue. This was the testimony of Sam Andrews at trial, and that the newspaper was probably an underground newspaper and completely unreliable. This is what Sam Andrews says of the Assyrian quest. He stated that he knew Mr. Malik, and that at one time Mr. Malik had been a member of the AUA, and that the quotes in the newspaper concerning Philip Malik's comments, this is Philip Malik, of course, I should say, um, comments on the AUA and its activities were hearsay. What he's talking about here is that there were accusations against Sam Andrews and Zaya Malik um, in the hearing that was conducted in Flint, Michigan, because there were accusations against them for taking money allegedly from the Iraqi government. He denied taking any money from the Iraqi government except for expenses and stated that he had not given any information about Malik Chikku, who was the chairman of the Christian Affairs in Kurdistan, who was fighting the Iraqi government to the Iraqi representatives at the United Nations in New York. This was the accusation. The prosecutor then read the newspaper article to the court, what happened in Flint, Michigan, AUA cover-up scandal, et cetera. Um, he then argued that the AUA mission in Baghdad was charged with working in the interests of the Iraqi government, Mr. Sam Andrews and Zaya Malik Ismail, members of that mission were accused of receiving illegal money, according to the articles, of course, from the Baghdad regime. Now, I should say this was before the enactment of a law called FARA, which I don't want to go into detail, Foreign Registration Act, which requires one, it's a federal law, law that requires one to register as an agent of a government. Uh, the accusations were made by Odishu Jindu in an open hearing in Flint, Michigan, that there was money accepted by these two individuals from the Iraqi government, and there was much speculation about what this money was for. These accusations were made against them by their own colleagues, according to the prosecutor, um, who worked with them closely in Baghdad. This was the argument. And because the hearing was open, in the spirit of free journalism, the quest, the Assyrian quest, published a brief news report about the events in its March 1975 issue. However, Mr. William Yonan, Secretary General of the AUA, sent a letter full of contempt and unfounded accusations, again, according to the prosecutor, which was published in the March-April issue of the Assyrian Star. This letter has prompted us to investigate the Assyrian, what, what was known as 
in various newspapers at this time, the Assyrian Watergate scandal, and published the highlights of what transpired in Flint, Michigan. Since the AUA officials showed more concern about the published news and attacked the quest for reporting the news of a public event, rather than the actual charges, the staff of the quest suspects that some of the officials of the AUA might have something to hide. And it is possible that there was some kind of cover up here because the Iraqi government seemed to be involved. Now, what were the accusations? In a meeting with the Iraqi agents in Paris, supposedly, Sam Andrews and Zaya uh, Ismail had allegedly received 4,000 in cash. The accused replied that this money was used to cover their expenses. Mr. Odishu Jindu, who was doing the accusations, accused the gentleman of receiving also $10,000, $30,000 in cash at the time. Again, we talked about the value of how much money that is today. In April um, of 1973, plus a monthly salary from the Iraqi regime in Baghdad, the purpose of which was to promote pro-Iraqi propaganda in the United States through the Assyrian media. These people who were accused responded that they received only 6,000 Iraqi dinars, uh, which are eight, 18,000 uh, US dollars. 10,000 went to uh, Zaya and 7,500 went to Sam and they denied receiving any monthly salary. Um, at this time, Mr. Odisha Jindu presented a letter written by Zaya Smile dated in November 2nd, 1973, in which he requested that the Iraqi government forward his monthly salary, which amounted to more than 3,000 uh, US dollars to the Iraqi embassy in Ottawa, Canada, and further stated that, the, that Sam Andrews was also in the same predicament. At this time, Zay admitted receiving a salary for three months, which amounted to 9,000, which was forwarded to the Iraqi embassy in Ottawa, Canada, on or about November, November 27, 1973. When Malik Chiku, chairman of the High Committee of Christian Affairs of Kurdistan, visited the United States, Sam and Zaya uh, compiled information allegedly and collected data about him and handed it to the Iraqi United Nations representatives in New York. The accused admitted collecting data and delivering it to the Iraqi agents in the United, Nation, uh, United Nations. Sam Andrews and Zaya Ismail proposed to the Iraqi government the creation of or the formation of an, an Assyrian commando unit consisting of Assyrian refugees who were fleeing the war in northern Iraq. The purpose of this unit was to assist the Iraqi military against the Kurds. The accused responded that the proposal was made, but that it was conditional, and the condition was that the Assyrian unit would be later to use to protect an Assyrian autonomous state, which would be supported by the Iraqi government. Another charge was that the accused delivered the constitution and bylaws of an Assyrian underground organization to the Assyrian uh, to the Iraqi officials in Baghdad. A further charge was that Zaya Ismail had a contract with the Iraqi government to export paper from Canada, which was to be used by the Ba'ath newspaper, Al Thawra. The accused requested a closed session to give a more complete response of the charges. The meeting was then closed and only a few AUA officials were present at this time. Mr. Jindu was not allowed to be present in this meeting and therefore not able to challenge any of the replies made, according to the reports, according to the documents. There was certainly anger at the patriarch. Um, Mr. Joseph Shumu, uh, Shumun Kallu testified that after the patriarch's visit to Iraq in 1970, David Ismail told me, quote, that him and his family were very much upset and annoyed about the fact that the patriarch wouldn't take their father and brother Zaya with him, meaning to Iraq, and they considered this an absolutely irresponsible act on behalf of the patriarch, on the side of the patriarch. Mr. Dennis Lazar, an Assyrian attorney from Michigan, testified that Reverend DeBaz had problems with the patriarch. He also testified throughout the trial that he had seen Reverend Epram Dibaz with uh, David. Now, what was all of this about? And I'm going to 
close this particular section with the comments of the attorney, the prosecuting attorney, uh, as to the motive here. He said in his closing argument, it's not an element in the crime. And I told you too, that there are various motives that I can see. I can't say, yes, this is definitely the reason that he did that. Yes, this is definitely the reason that he did it. I am leaving it up to you from all the evidence, motive, AUA motive, question mark. He feels that his father was killed, died as a result of the patriarch's marrying motive. He feels that his own life was destroyed as a result of the patriarch marrying. Who knows? We don't know why people do certain things. Never be able to show, <laughs> excuse me, why they do certain things. In a court of law, you don't have to show motive. What you have to show is what happened. And we have shown that by the physical evidence, by the witness, witnesses who have traced him this far, by this gun, by the fact that the man was shot three times, meaning the patriarch, by Ms. Shumun's own testimony, meaning we know what happened, we don't need to show much else. Now, at this time, I'm going to tell you that I had a, a long discussion with the prosecutor. I was very fortunate to be able to find him. He had since retired, of course. And I asked him, do you think there was a conspiracy here against the patriarch? Do you think there was an arrangement by others to kill the patriarch? And he said, most definitely, yes. And I asked why in 19... 75 or 1976 when the trial took place was no conspiracy charged why was only murder charged and he conceded that it was very difficult he told me that at one point he had a conversation with the defendant because there was a he recalled a technical issue in this trial where the matter was remanded to the court and rather than go through the trial again, as many prosecutors and even judges are reluctant to do, they attempted to make a deal with the defendant. And the deal was that he would accept less time in return for basically telling on those who assisted him. And there was a time given because the prosecutor told me that they were intercepting letters between David Ismail and, and others. They were intercepting these letters, reading them, and trying to figure out who he was communicating with and what was the point of the communication, and that he had sensed that there was involvement of many other parties in this, perhaps even a government not something you can easily prove at trial, but he felt that he could perhaps have a conversation with David Ismail and find out. And he, in fact, did have this conversation while David Ismail was in prison. And David Ismail had said that he would consider and let the prosecutor know at a later time. And when the prosecutor approached him again a second time, Approximately a week or two weeks later, uh, David Ismail did not want to have any conversation with the prosecutor. And so the matter was settled there. It ended there in terms of a further prosecution. And Mr. Ismail was released from prison to the surprise of many. He interacted with the church whose patriarch was assassinated. Um, he had sympathies in certain quarters of Assyrians because of the animosities with the late patriarch. And others, of course, were very unforgiving and were shocked and were um, on two sides of, of this issue where Assyrians were um, divided clearly divided, and, in, and possibly until today. So I'd like to end here, and I apologize for taking so long, but 
I just want to share with you some reflections about the life of the patriarch Mar'i Shimon. He was tossed into this storm of a situation, really without his own will at age 12. He fought as an idealistic leader, as a secular leader. He fought against the odds, for sure. He gained, eventually, over time, after trying and failing, a realistic sense of his abilities, of what was possible and what was not. In other words, he matured in a very political way. And he realized what were the limitations in the world of what his nation could do, what type of solution he can find for his people. And so he took a few steps back, became much more of a diplomatic person and attempted to start anew. He came to accept his own personal limits and his humanity before being assassinated. It was a tragic loss for many Assyrians. It was a difficult uh, situation for many, even those who disliked him, a very painful moment in Assyrian history. And it certainly was a transformative moment uh, for the entire nation and the Church of the East.